everybody. This is Robin Ayub from the Localization Fireside Chat, and welcome to another episode. Today, I have the pleasure and the honor to be joined by Eddie Arietta. Eddie is the CEO of Multilingual Media, which I'm assuming all of our audience in the localization industry is very familiar with, and pretty much uh, Eddie's well known in the industry uh, through the media and through the uh, support that this particular media outlet has been given the industry and championing the industry on a uh, on a variety of topics. So, Eddie, welcome to the conversation. Uh, glad to have you with us. Thank you, Robin, and the honor is shared. Uh, I've seen so many amazing people uh, join your conversations, and um, I'm amazed uh, that I'm invited. Uh, to the conversation, but also, you know, I take the responsibility uh, uh, to do so, and I'm, I hope we have a great conversation today. Absolutely. So let's get started. So again, uh, like most of our audience know by now, that the style of these types of conversation is a dialogue. It's not an interview. We're simulating having a coffee at a Starbucks somewhere, and uh, two guys, they haven't met or they have been so long since they've met each other, and they want to get an update on what's going on in the personal and business life. And let's get started. So, Eddie, just to get us started, just to frame our conversation, would you mind tell us a little bit about your personal journey? Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and a bit more about your personal journey and where you are right now. Yeah, fantastic. I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful uh, once again to be able to, to, to talk to you and, and having a coffee. I'll, I'll make some mentions to coffee later. I'm from Colombia in <laughs> South America, a city called Cincelejo. The capital uh, of coffee. In the capital of coffee, Colombia, and uh, I'm from the north coast, so the Caribbean side of Colombia. I'm from that part, so Cartagena, Barranquilla, uh, all that area. Since so those are the coastal cities, I'm about like 40 to 45 minutes away from the coast, so I get the chance to go there very often. Um, very tropical, very hot all year round. This year is supposed to be a rainy year. Uh, I like it. It's nothing like I've seen in other places, but I'll, I'll try to summarize uh, because I'm very grateful to like most parts of my life. Uh, I would say all parts of my life. So I could talk forever about all these details. Uh, but um, born and raised in Cincelejo, the, the state is called Sucre, the north coast of Colombia, Caribbean, very tropical, lots of salsa, lots of music, uh, um, uh, a little bit of chaos, right? Uh, uh, people that really care about social issues, the whole romanticism of Latin America. Every, every, every single uh, preconceived notion that you have of Latin America, you have it in Cincelejo. And that's where I'm from. I'm a, a Latin American, like through and through. Um, and I've had the opportunity to uh, visit other places around the world, and that has opened up my mind to, you know, the possibilities and the things that we could do if we are able to talk to one another and communicate. So I love this conversation. I had the opportunity when I was around 15, 16 years old um, to get a scholarship to go to this place in uh, Wales called Lantwit Major, and the place is called the United War Colleges. And uh, the United World Colleges are these, I'd say, uh, sisterhood of schools around the world that look to raise global citizens that ultimately care about what's happening around the world and want to make an impact, a local or global or all sorts of impact. Uh, and I really bought into that idea. And I felt that all I wanted to do was to do good. Uh, and, and of course, along the way, you, do, uh, you make tons of mistakes like irreparable mistakes. But what you end up doing is you start figuring out that uh, you can be a good citizen and you can, you can do good around the world. So I bought into that. That was 16 years old. Then I had the, that was two years. I had the opportunity to go to the U.S. Uh, for college at another small town called Fulton, Missouri. So I come, it was in Celejo, Colombia, Landwin Major, Wales. Fulton, Missouri. That's crazy. It's crazy. Uh, four years, I did international business, some economics, some French. Uh, and then I decided to come back to Colombia against all odds. All of my friends were like, why are you going to Colombia? There are no services there. I'm like, I know. We live in trees. I'm like, use taparraos is what we call, right? Like the thing that covers your butt is just the, the leaf. On the front, it's like, yeah, that's how we dress all day long. But it's, it's, it's amazing when you start seeing that, you know, you get um, comparable levels of services. There are others that you don't get, and, and you know, we'll talk about 
that probably in a bit. But then, you know, Fulton, uh, Missouri, I decide to come back to Colombia. I go to Medellin. That's where my sisters were studying. I have a twin sister, Melissa. Twin. So I'm a twin, right? Uh, Melissa is a pediatrician, a medical doctor. And then I have a younger sister, Marcella. And then my parents live in this hometown in Cincelejo. So when I go to Medellin, I meet my wife, Lauren. Uh, she's a saxophone player, and I got her uh, her saxophone. She wanted a really good saxophone, and we're family friends. So I helped her get saxophone to Colombia. Then two kids later, uh, you know, we've been married for 11 years now. Marco is my oldest son, eight years old. It's going to be nine in December. Mateo, four years old, going to be five in February. They love life. We love life. Um, we are very entrepreneurial. Uh, family. So that's why I said coffee was going to become a thing. So uh, we opened up a bakery about like seven years ago, eight years ago, and I don't have my logo. I used to have a big logo to show, but it's a bakery and it's a coffee shop. So we get coffee from some parts of Colombia. And I'd say we have some of the best coffee I've tasted. I taste, I've, tasted. I've become uh, a, a coffee lover. I used to drink a lot of coffee, but, but now I'm, I'm a coffee lover. I love to sell everything, right, uh, from, from like life to what I do. Um, so when I'm in Colombia, I uh, co-found a company uh, called Espacio, which was a co-working space, the first co-working space in Medellin, Colombia. Mm -hmm. in, when, when this was all happening, I had no idea what startups were. Well, I had no idea. What to, I, w I went to Silicon Valley when I was in the U.S. I went for a program in Silicon Valley, and we visited the Monterey Institute. Mm -hmm. I had no idea what Silicon Valley was or, like, the importance of technology. Zero. No idea. I was lost, completely lost. Okay. And then in that process, you know, this is when I'm getting married, um, I visited San Francisco for the first time. I've never, I, for, the, for the first time, but this was my second time, I had already been there. I did tours in Facebook. Like, we, I saw the wall where people sign, like, with the work of Facebook. I saw that wall. Like, I was there. <laughs> and they're they are explaining to us how great they are, and like, in this mm -hmm. select group of people. I was so lost. <laughs> then when I go back, I'm like, oh, my God. This was that <laughs> thing that I was doing. I'll get it. Okay, fine. Incredible. And then I yep. fell. Like, I was such a loser. I was like, oh my God, I'm such an imposter. That's this whole process. It's, it's incredible, like the things that you go to. But it really opened up my mind to technology. And yep. the great thing about technology is that you can leapfrog like that. Yes, that right. really inspired me because during COVID, my wife and I decided to move back to Cincelejo. We were living in Medellin. We decided to okay. move back to Cincelejo. And... Um, is this where you're living right now, uh, Eddie? This is where I'm living right now. Well, and yeah, then okay. I knew after COVID, it's like remote work is the enabler. Like yeah. it, it is the enabler. So it opens a whole bunch of doors, doesn't it? Absolutely. And then, so right after that, uh, that, that's the path, right? I discovered remote work in this new sense. I had been doing international work through, I would never turn on my camera. Mm. And it's crazy when you start talking about like being able to turn on the camera. It's like, and then you go to events, physical events, and you shake your hands and you know each other. Yep. It changes the game. This industry, localization, which I stumble upon by, by mistake, I would say, but then not again. I have a con I'll share something as a concept that I have been coining in that, uh, with you. But it's, uh, it's, it's become a, a blessing in disguise because the localization industry consolidates remote work. So as I'm doing this first co-working space, we also co-found a uh, PR company called Publicize out of Medellin. After five years or so, I moved to an HR tech company called Torre. And Torre is co-founded by a Colombian called Alexander Torre Negra. So this okay. guy uh, is a successful startup entrepreneur. He started a voice company. So a voiceover company, he's basically a marketplace for voiceover artists. That's it. Okay. And he does that really well. He, he sold that company and kept an agency that basically gets talent to like go work somewhere. And now Torre is an a, AI solution for HR companies. So I was there doing a project called Torre Coach initially, okay. which is, is, a process, is a project to get people to come like the matrix. Like, so people are working out there. They don't work remotely. They don't know how to do this thing, right? Like how this change 
this conversation, this, in, this information. They don't know how to do this. So they have to work in the physical world, let's say. And I work in the physical world too, but I mean, you really depend on like that physical. So we take the people with talent, we bring them here, turn on a camera, a microphone, and say, you sit here. This is where you work. That's and right. if not, you take your laptop and you do it anywhere you want it, right? That uh, was an amazing an amazing process. So we had coaches there that would uh, help people do this, like professional coaches. I tried to do it myself. It's not as easy, but people people change. People change, sure. and that's the, that was the whole concept around that. But then after that, this company is a company that helps people find remote work. So I was already working there, so I was just like using the platform. And then someone called uh, Joseph from Ninsi Insights was looking for uh remote workers i'm like okay what are you looking for it's like sales i'm like i can do sales i mean i've yeah. found them my own companies like i know yeah, how to yeah. do sales i know how to sell anything right so joseph is like yeah i think i think i think you should talk to our you know manager our sdr manager and you know if you want to be an sdr so i was like yeah sure i'll be an sdr and I loved it uh, because as I was looking into it, I was like, what is this industry? I remember watching a video of Talker yeah. and I was like, this is like Bloomberg. Like, what is going on here? Who are these people? I've seen this before. I've seen this before because, you know, when, when markets are consolidating like really well, people cover them. Like, sure. that, like the financial markets. It's like the reason why everyone covers is because it's so great. So. We want as many people doing this as possible. We want so many podcasts. We want, we want so many conversations that we cannot even handle it. Like it's, 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 it's so I was like, okay, something, what's happening here? Yep. So I start looking into Ninsi and I'm like, you do this consulting thing and you help these companies that already are helping other companies. I'm like, okay, this is great. It's, it looks solid. It looks like, uh, but I, I, what I did not expect is, um, and this is what I call uh, optimizing for serendipity. Uh, like what I did not expect was to find such, um, such an interconnected ecosystem. Yeah. That I did not expect. There are like it, is, it is an interconnected. Infinitely more like degrees, degrees from what I expected. Like it's immeasurable uh, how much interconnected there is. And yeah, how the, much... the entire industry is all meshed now. In terms yeah, of connections, it's incredible. So that's how I've landed. Uh, that's how I've landed. And then from Nimsi Insights, Nimsi Insights has a, an amazing program for SDRs. So I went through three, three months of training about the industry. I got to know everything, like associations, like who sells what, what is an LSP. I had no <laughs> idea what an LSP was, let alone localization, like or any of the other acronyms or like anything like that. Once again, completely lost, right? Uh, but that training was very critical in like help me, helping me confirm uh, kind of like my own instincts around what I was seeing from an sure. industry. Uh, and I say, okay, just like certain levels of innovation probably would spark things very. And then you start seeing that there are already people doing that in the industry. And you're like, all right, it's happening now. It needs, it needs, uh, uh, um, Higher degree, higher degrees of a structure, uh, of but it's going super well, I think. Of course. So um, I really appreciate sharing uh, you sharing this information with us and with the audience. What a remarkable journey that you've been through. You're still on, and you, I can still feel the energy coming through you. Uh, I can still feel the excitement, which is, you know, quite refreshing. One of my next questions is going to be the state of the industry. And based on, you know, we're recording today our episode number 84 on this podcast. So we've talked to a few people along the line here as we continue recording these conversations on a weekly basis to a lot of decision makers, I would say, in the, in the industry that came here and they, to this channel. And we've sh they've shared their thoughts, their ideas, their hopes and desires, their fears, et cetera. So one of the things is like, as I see the passion in you and I see the excitement about the industry, can you talk a little bit about where's the industry now from your perspective? Uh, you know, you work for a, a large research firm, you know, with the media arm to that research firm, you must have a lot of access to where is the industry th sits. And normally Renato gives me like a full blown presentation on this answer. I'm just trying to get candidly with you as to what is your thoughts? What's your ideas? Where do you see the industry now? That's a great question, of course. I have to start with, so, so 
NIMSI trains me really well. February 2023, uh, I get this conversation about whether I've been interested into moving into multilingual uh, magazine. And I hope, so get me, right? Like when I see Tucker, John's CNN, and then I see multilingual, it's like, okay, this is like the Atlantic. This is the, yeah, that's right. Times, that's the Atlantic. Times Magazine of the industry. That's Are you right. asking me? Like, you, you really, this is not even, it's not, not a doubt, right? Like it, it was, so I felt like they've never really had a salesperson, Marjolaine, uh, who did an amazing job, was the CEO. So she started as a, as a marketing coordinator and CEO takes the magazine to become this very sophisticated, well-written, well-distributed product. And it, it, I get that offer in, you know, I, so February, get to work with Marjolaine all this time, learning now about companies that, you know, are talking about this actively, doing, doing a lot of media. Uh, and in November of last year, Marjolaine mentions that she's looking to transition in November of 2024. So November. <laughs> and in, in, in this year, a year later, right, so I joined February, February 2024, Marjolaine saying that I don't think I'm going to leave in uh, November. I think I want to leave earlier. I think, you know, this, this, is, this is ready. So I had the trust yeah. of, of the board. And then with that, um, then I embark in this pro process of now completing this, this cycle of understanding kind of like where the industry is at. I'm just contextualizing for, you know, <laughs> mentioning state of the industry. I think the first thing that came to mind was that I don't think, and I have to check, I haven't really checked what all the consultants are saying, but I, I get this gut feeling that we, we're really not very, we are not in agreement of what the constituent elements of like measure are right now. Like we're measuring different things. And I don't think we're considering many things that are incredible to me. I, I'm, I'm going to go next week to the COP16 meeting by the United Nations in Cali, Colombia. So I'm going to be representing the state where I live, Sucre, which is the state of Cincelejo. Yes. And it's, and, and I think I lost my train of thought with this one. What, the, what, what the status of the point? industry, again, um, you, and you mentioned that the consultants are not in agreement, in agreement or the constituent elements of, of measures. We're not in agreement. Okay. So in this COP event next, the, the next week, you should see the number of translators they are hiring. They don't work in any, in, in any companies. They don't even know that the industry exists. This thing we call the industry, we are not, we are not even noticing. We, we are like scratching the surface pretty much. And then you have these people, like this, this translator, she's going to be making $1,500 for translating for like a whole week, $1,500. And this is just someone I know, someone I know, right? And I make this connection. How many more people? This is an 18,000 people event, right. 190 something countries, 14 yeah. heads of a state. Who is measuring how much money, how much translation and interpretation right. money, we're, how many tools we are using? I think we are not measuring even, we're not even like close. I, that's what I think. Now, the concept of the industry might die. And that might be considered, oh, the industry died. That's a possibility. I don't think it will because it's, like we said, it's super interconnected. Yep. So it's found in that interconnection a power to succeed and a power yep. to thrive forward, right? To help the ecosystem. And what the system has done and what I've seen is it's, it evolves very quickly. Very mm -hmm. quickly, the level of adoption in the conversation is in parallel with startups. That means you're moving at a, the right pace because most conventional businesses do not move at the, at the pace of technology. Yeah. The industry is really able to make a spin to it and have translators and linguists continue being relevant in the conversation. That's amazing. That's like... That's very, very promising. So I should say that I have seen a, um, an evolution from the beginning of the year when I started, you know, in April of this year. We've been doing this for two quarters. Uh, I'd say um, what I've seen is an evolution on the tone 
around uh, technology, I think there was a lot of reverence to technology or in particular, really what we've been calling artificial intelligence. There was a bit of reverence to, to, to kind of like refer to it and a lot mm -hmm. of like respect and honor. And I think that's, that's now, uh, that, that's, I'm not going to say lost. Uh, I think the, the respect has been, is, is being rebalanced. Mm -hmm. And now the conversation is more like, yeah, this is not uh, like we use this thing, right? Yeah. There's yep. still a reverberance of that, like idea of like, oh, the fr the frantic, uh, panicky reaction to like this new technology is gonna do like it's like, I don't think you've been meditating enough. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. I think you should meditate a bit more. Just meditate a take bit it more, as yeah. a, take it as a positive. Make a spin out of this and have <laughs> have creative like business models. Preferably after one hour yoga, right? Yeah, we're we're like talking we're talking we're talking business here. Like, what are we talking about? Like, we're talking about like, do people want this or not? If they don't, you do something else. That's right. And the constituent elements of the value you add stay stay there. Yeah. Right. Uh, technology has empowered so many translators and interpreters to do so much amazing stuff that what I'm seeing then is an evolution of, of the crafts that That's I right. see around. And, and that also includes multilingual. I love how you put it, evolution of the craft. Absolutely, you're yes. correct. Yeah, uh, multilingual is doing that. So, so yeah. we, are, we are partnering with Pangeanic uh, to have our content be translated, but also to have you know, uh, a conversation with our content <laughs> and yeah. ask questions about the content we have on multilingual. And let me be very honest, we're super open to all sorts of partnerships, right? To be able to understand how this is evolving, I think we just have to understand what I think we know, which is sure. association, cooperation, and collaboration is the key differentiator. Correct. Because if we, we all want you to succeed, we want all companies in the industry to succeed. We want all podcasts in the industry to succeed. We want all events to be packed with people that don't know about this so that that thing that we call the industry continues to exist. So it's kind of like the decision of the industry at this point. You know, one of the things I noticed in the industry, and I, uh, I'm like you, I entered the industry by accident 21 uh, years ago. I noticed about the industry is we, uh, in comparison to other industries, and uh, we all belong to the knowledge base industry. This industry belonged to a larger industry, which is called the knowledge base industry. And I call it that entire content life cycle, like, it depends on where we are. Like in the translation business and the localization business, we are in the transformation of content from one language to another. But however, some but some other sub industry in the knowledge base industry, they are in the content creation. Of course, our industry is waking up to the idea of creating content. And I see a lot of companies now starting up a, a creating content in native languages, which is great, in target languages, which is great. Now, one of the things is first I want to give you and your team a lots of kudos for supporting the team and for supporting the industry. That's very admirable. Personal experience on my side, every time I send a press release to your team, uh, they're very helpful. They post it online, uh, they share it. I really appreciate that on behalf of the localization fireside chat and my readers, everybody who participate in this conversation, thank you from the bottom of my heart for your support. I really appreciate that. Now, going back to the, you've taken on the role in multimedia. Tell us a little bit about you know, what has changed in terms of your editorial strategy, your challenges that you face, perhaps that you want to fix or not, maybe there is no challenges, maybe there are opportunities, every challenge is an opportunity. And adapting to global market, as you mentioned earlier, you're translating your content. So what has changed since you took over? Have you made an assessment? Uh, what does the editorial strategy look like or, or strategy in general? What's the hope and desire for multilingual? Where do you want to be in five years? Those kinds of thoughts. That's that's an amazing question. Thank you. Um, it allows me to to think. I think the 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 first thing is uh, I believe in structure, or or I believe rather that structure should be as basic as possible. The more ramifications and rules and 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 you know to go things uh, you have, the the slower you get over time. So I think structure has to be clean. And, and to me, that also means a lot of trust. That's, that's really what it ultimately means. You, you, you have to trust um, that uh, we are on the same page about direction as, as, as a team and that 
we understand that most of these things are up to us and that there are no uh, bottlenecks unless we have black swans, meaning, okay, I can perform, right? I can perform uh, at, at, at my, with, with plenty of space and because I love what I do, I'm not counting hours. I can't count hours and I don't want to ever count hours, right? I work as much as I can and as much as I want. Uh, that is very clear. And, and everyone um, in the team has had that. Um, so, so there are a lot of things to continue, I'd say. I think that's the first thing, a lot of things to continue doing in terms of the, the culture of the organization. Uh, the one thing that uh, I've been focusing on in, in the past few months that I found as a great opportunity and that we were doing it uh, timidly um, was consolidating um, conversations with our partners, uh, associations, universities, uh, and, and companies, and, and also thought leaders and our community yep. at large. And, and using that for, to create content and to propagate content. So when, when uh, you know, we see Robin making an effort uh, to have a podcast in general, if it's if it's not related to a company, we're like we're all in. We're all in. We're gonna promote it. We like it. We we have guests for you uh, because it makes sense for 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 everyone. So uh, doing that with events, and then when assisting events, uh, doing as much coverage of the event as many people talking about the event, the better. That's right. We don't have enough people to talk to everyone. And, and you know what, what I noticed as well, I'm not sure if you agree, in comparison to other industries, one, one point I was going to mention earlier, is we don't talk about our industry enough. I find other industries are louder in terms of the n number of interviews they do, in terms of the media they, they put out there. If you're, talk, if you're looking at any other industry, automotive, pharmaceutical, whatever industry you want to pick, we seem to be under the rock. As you mentioned earlier, you know, there are some translators who are going to be working at this meeting that you mentioned earlier. And they probably don't know about our industry. Translators. How about people who are not in the translation business? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so, 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 yeah. It's um, a lot, lots of things to continue. Uh, a few things to try. Um, this is this is gonna be a first. Uh, you, you heard it here a localization fireside chat with Robin Ayub. I have not talked about this to anyone. We haven't published this, um, but. Because we come from HR background, I mean, I, I just came from Torre. I, I am very sensitive to humans and talent and people getting the right jobs and people, you know, finding opportunities and finding what they love. I like this thing. So we realized that there are some, the, the efforts that the industry is making around talent are very timid, uh, are just like, hey, we have this job board and we have a job board, a multilingual. We approve jobs and that's it. And we don't even know what happens if they find a job or not. And then there are some companies that are doing uh, some staffing services, providing some yes. staffing services. Um, but what I don't see is the elevation of the conversation around human resources. From the technical perspective, Torre, because Torre was in the HR business, they had conferences about this. They talk about this all the time. So we said, how about we do a virtual event for the industry uh, where we bring companies that are offering jobs and then people that don't have jobs. And that's all we're going to do. And we're going to send them to your website. So ATA has a job board. We'll send them to the ATA job board. We'll send, if you have one at localization fireside chat, we'll send them to your job sure, board. Yeah. We, we don't. First of all, we don't want to be a job board. Second of all, we don't want to be a talent company. Third of all, we have we have we have no interest in becoming um, I don't know an HR a consultant for HR consultants. Consultant. No, no. We care that our partners can find better talent, and that our readers, that a lot of our readers are unemployed, can find can find work, and if yeah. they can do it through your website. Fantastic. What we care about is, is spreading knowledge. So that is one thing that we're going to try. It's well, scheduled. congratulations with. on this initiative. And thanks yes. for sharing it with me on this channel today. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. And it's going to be on November 21st, 22nd. These are the expected dates right now. We have a landing page. We, we will share it uh, probably by the time. Uh, so we should schedule this so that it goes out at the same time. I think it'll be Absolutely. amazing. But we, we look forward to getting companies and staffing companies 
to like come and, and like partner, partner with you, right? partner with us. We we yeah. are content creators and we are creating your platform. We'll never intend for this to be in person ever. In person events that exist right now, I love all of them. So yeah. I I'm, I'm already making my schedule for next year, which events I'm gonna be attending, uh, and I love that. Right, so I know. For a fact that I'm gonna be a gala, I know for a fact that I'm gonna be at Vamos Juntos in Mexico. I know for a fact I'm gonna be at the Lock Worlds, um, and then uh, I think I'm gonna be uh, uh, visiting some new events uh, this year if if, if uh, time allows. And we're trying to like make sure I'm that when we go I to see you event, face to face at one of these. Yes, events. we will do that. <laughs> we should have another uh, coffee in person. I love that. Yes, because because I think and then you will do in localization today. <laughs> we should definitely get it done. Yeah, and 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 I I just want to make sure that when we go to these events, we cover them well, that we they get the chance to talk to as many people as possible because it's really hard to sit down with someone and record it, their audio. It takes time. You know how much effort it takes to edit and to and to just schedule people. Oh, so, yeah. I, we want to make it easier for everyone in the industry to give as many people as much visibility as possible. And we think there, there there should be more publications. So you're telling me yeah. like five years, ten years is like there need there there is going to be there should be more publications. Yeah, yeah. There, there no. needs to be more. Hey Eddie, let's talk a little bit about your let's talk about leadership. And you know, every leader has their own style. So would you mind talking a little about your leadership philosophy? How do you navigate change with your team? I'm sure you have team that reports to you and you gotta manage a lot of these conversations. And what is your strategy to building or continue building or improving the global brand that you've established over the years with this particular uh, media company? Yeah, and, and kudos to the people that have been in multilingual for the past 37 years. It's like- We can it, only carry the torch forward, right? Yes, yes, it's, it's really <laughs> impressive. It's really impressive. Uh, I, I think that's, that needs to be recognized. I only see the future because of, of the people. Is that, is that how, how it goes, right? Because I'm standing in the shoulders of, of giants uh, of sorts. Very well put, very well put. <laughs> and, and now I, didn't, I don't know where I was going with that. Uh, so, what was the question again? Leader, leadership philosophy. Leadership. Yes, 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 yes. Let's yes. start with that. Um, yeah. So, so it's uh, I've heard a lot of definitions about leadership, and and some are problematic to me. They are all probably most incomplete, and it is likely a very personal journey uh, in which you first lead yourself. Uh, and then you realize that a lot of the leadership uh, reverbs around like listening and and like in introspection and forgiveness and and also optimism. Uh, it's, it's got different tastes, it, and it feels more like a chef's a chef's um, activity, right? Where you put the ingredients. Some people like putting all the ingredients like, to make the recipe looks good. Some people love the spice, right? <laughs> and some people. I uh, love the the their sodas, you know, with a lot of sugar, right? And, uh, yep. and you know, you got to respect uh, the paths. Um, what I found is that in specific sectors and markets, um, sure. you know, leadership translates into potential structure and mostly communication. And I I think I'm an over communicator. That that that's one of the elements that I've learned at previous places. Uh, I like Torre, over always over communicate. I'm really good at over communicating, as you've been able to have a lot of words. I could say I could say what I'm saying with ten percent of the words, probably. I love this conversation. Eddie, yeah, it's one of the best conversations I've had for a week. Amazing, good. But yeah, it's a, um, I communi we communicate a lot, and we and we have uh, I believe structure allows for um, the protection of knowledge. So we have a specific structures like like a day like dailies and, and daily reports that are just like me saying like since my last update, this is what I've done, right? And yep. sometimes, you know, the aim is to do it daily, but sometimes I take two days to do it because I am busy doing stuff. Sure. I'm, I'm just doing, I'm doing good to me. Yeah, the you're busy. You're busy. You're so working. good that uh, this report can be done in two days for sure. So I am very flexible. I, I think I just, just coming back a few steps, I believe like what Ray Dalio presents, right? Like there are principles. Uh, I don't agree with all his principles, but I, I agree with the general idea that whoever is to succeed holds principles, whether consciously or unconsciously. 
Yeah. So like like my grand my grandfather, like he had a structure, but he was unconscious of it. But that structure allowed like a level of success, right? Driving your own sure. house, like educating your children, like that 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 sure. sort of thing. So I believe structure that first structure uh, really provides uh, the legs or, or the place for you to get started. And then, so there are principles there and, you know, I would share them as they evolve and they might appear, they might disappear. They might come more uh, prevalent at certain points. So as an example, right now, we have a one that I stole from Renato, which is now instead of how, and no, you have to be super not. careful with that. You have to be super careful with that because that means you print out things that could be wrong. You can make <laughs> mistakes and we have. But it's like, we said now instead of how, so. I love that. I'm going to copy this one. <laughs> yes. It, it's, it's very dangerous. It's very dangerous. Well, you got you, you to use it at your own risk. Caution. Is that how it works? <laughs> I recommend extreme caution and a, a huge levels of humility because, you know, um, you have to be humble. I'd say that's, yep. uh, that's another principle. You have to be humble. Um, you can you can. I don't like the idea of like, don't take yourself very seriously. Like that one, I don't like. Take yourself extremely seriously uh, so that you can hold yourself accountable. But oh, you're 100%. honest. And if you're honest, then yep. you know, you, 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 take, you take certain decisions. So you have to be humble because you know that what has taken you this far is yep. a lot of failures, but not True. the failures in themselves, but the lessons around the failures that become part of like the story that you're every building. failure is a lesson exactly and and if, if you can always have a long-term vision of things and yep. that's, that's that's something else right like if we know we're going in the right direction all other things become very up, up to whoever is deciding it's your taste right yeah. you say why are we doing more podcasts now and he showed me the proof yeah. That says that this conversation that you're having with Robin, it is really valuable. It's like it, I'm gonna steal the one from Gary Vaynerchuk, where he's like, <laughs> "What is the what is the ROI?" This is my uh, Gary Vaynerchuk. Right. It's the ROI. What is the ROI of like your mother's love? It's like, oh yeah, of course, don't be silly. But there's something similar. Like you could potentially measure, but like the effort of measuring takes from the creative, and the creative really leads innovation. Uh, that's Correct. what innovation is at the end of the day. Um, so sure. so yeah. I don't even know if I So, Eddie, a um, um, couple more points and we'll wrap it up. One point is I want you to imagine the content in 2030. In 2030, which is five, six years from now, five years from now almost, where you can inject the how technology is going to shape us forward, how uh, communication is going to shape us fo forward, how the new uh, dynamics that are taking place in the, in the transition industry and in the localization industry are shifting the industry uh, to be something that is different than what it is uh, now. And we all know that the industry is very reluctant to change. It starts with the individual. The individuals in our industry are very reluctant to change. Everybody knows that. I'm not insulting anybody. That's the nature of who we are. Uh, people set a pace for themselves and they love to stick to that pace or stick to that process that they're, that they're living in, which is normal to everybody. It's not, it's not unusual. But there's a lot of things coming in, or there's a lot of challenges, I would say, if you don't like change, that they're coming into the industry. 2030, looking down the road for five years from now, where do you think the uh, language content landscape would look like? And specifically, how does multimedia, um, uh, uh, multilingual media will be impacted or not impacted or supported in that, in that, in that vein? I have my vision. But I'm interested to hear your vision. Curious. What's your What's your vision? So I would think in 2030 we will stop doing a translation in the form of what we know today. In 2030 we will be in more in a we will be in a like right now as most people would say, um, and I don't know how true it is. I mean, it's all started. You can see it around. We are living in some way somewhat of a post localization era right now. It's starting. Not taken off yet, but in 2030, I don't think we'll be transforming content anymore. I think we'll be creating content in the target language more than transforming the content. I don't know if I'm, my prediction will uh, will live to to, to uh, 2030 as, as as a true, 
but I see it, see the writing on the on the wall with gener generative AI improving with um, you know all tools and technology uh, technologies are getting a lot better. I you know my my background as as I don't know if I told you, but my background is computer science and and I've been I've been a technologist for many years before I joined this industry. I see a huge shift in the technology right now, and the sh the biggest shift is the time it takes us to develop something in technology right now. It used to take us 10 years to put something on. I'm exaggerating to make a point. But it used to take us a long time to put a technology, piece of technology out. Today, anybody can move to anyone, you know, open an account in any platform and start putting a an app out on, uh, I think it's called Bubbles. You can go to um, a platform. You can develop your app for free and you can put it out like in nothing. I mean, you don't need to know coding. You don't need to do any of that stuff. So things are moving fast in terms of technology. And what we know about technology now may not be the same in three, four months from now. So what's your vision for 2030? Thank you for the question. <laughs> You're making it so easy. Nah, it's, it's great. It's great. I love these questions. And of course, there's so many sides to it. Uh, uh, thank you for sharing your, your thought. Yeah, I, I think I agree with what you're saying in, in terms of the content that uh, will just be automatic. It's just, it's just automatic. I've, I've been working as an example on seeing this sales pitch for the COP16 in Cali uh, with the UN. And yep. uh, just ChatGPT is so helpful because I have all the information. I know what I want. Okay, the, here is the 22-page report on like what, what the, the, our goals are over there. Just what, what does it say? Yeah, it yeah, yeah. 300 words and tells me exactly what I knew it said. And then I just kind of skim over. It's like, yeah, okay, I got, I got it, right? Sometimes you don't have time for that. And I think the, 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 the industry definitely is going to start getting a lot of these pre-work things done, right? Like uh, all of the same conversations happening over and over again. I see the multilingual. We, we have very similar conversations when it comes to the creation of certain pieces of content. Uh, and then when you start seeing those patterns, you just start saving writers some valuable time that should be devoted to the creative process. Sure. So I think what, what this does is it creates a, a, a beautiful ecosystem for high quality creative content with the same amount of effort. Yep. Same amount of effort, high, much higher like creative content. I, I, I think I think that's gonna be beautiful for the industry to recognize for linguists to recognize that value and the usage of this. I think I wish I could call myself a linguist. Oh, that would open up so many possibilities, right? And if yep. you have the knowledge of the technologies, you are you are really well set. Well so I think um in twenty thirty we we should see a more robust incubation ecosystem so i had time to just put it into a sure. sentence otherwise i'd rumble right yeah so this incubation ecosystem similar to what's happening with the startups and we already see it i think um i think you no know, translated gives a grant every year for people doing research that can be applied to the industry yep. it's like applied research grants to like innovate in the industry Next thing we need to do, and, and we should talk to a few companies, we should talk to Logworld. Logworld does it in a little, a, a little bit with the peak, but we don't have like a startup incubation process. Okay? What's, what's the organization that takes 20 uh, language-related uh, technology up, like specific to the industry? Why? Because there is a huge advantage. Like how many startups have you seen coming out of the industry, like Blackbird.io? And yeah. it's just because it comes from the industry, it's got like yeah. plus. It's like I'm not a startup, like I'm 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 playing the I'm playing with the with the big people. So uh, I think that's that's gonna get better in the industry. Like the respect to what you were talking about in terms of like the speed of technology. I think the industry is really well versed in how to like apply technology to this specific area of the market. Scenarios, yeah. Uh, yeah, this, 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 this area. So I would say there will be much more, like you're saying, because of Gen AI. There's going to be much more, but not only because of Gen AI. I, I see much more creativity coming out of the writers now because now they've got a point to prove. It almost feels like that. They're like... <laughs> This ChatGPT thing does not help me as much. I will go ahead and write. I'm smarter than ChatGPT. That's what they're going to do. And then you see amazing, amazing creative 
it's improving the quality, quality, isn't it? Yes, yes. And I think once you start conversing, very and, good and point. Very good point. Once you start research and using ChatGPT for research, yep. and then brainstorming, oh, they'll see. They'll see that it's just like okay, it's, it just enabled me to like come up with better ideas because Excellent. I have conversations with writers about like what they could write about, and then. I come up with my ideas from my understanding, but I also got ideas from ChatGPT. And sometimes I, I identify from 10, the one that actually makes sense because yep. I know the industry and I know the people. But you know, it, it, it facilitates out of my input uh, through some like uh, uh, content that's related yep. to me, yep. directly related to me. And that's yep. very important. So I think writers are starting to realize that. So I see, a higher level of use of artificial intelligence for the translation of our content and our writers being okay with that mm -hmm. instead of having it to right now for example we use ai for the audio transformation of the articles and last time i heard it sounded so natural i was like oh this is scary it's, it's not the crazy, same yeah. as me reading it for sure but Huh, you can take it. You can take it for yeah. two minutes yep. and you get the gist of the article. If, if you, what sure. you want is an, uh, an audio experience, this is going to improve significantly. I think the sure. audio experience in the industry is going to change. There will be many more podcasters, many more YouTube channels. There should be at least, very least, three, four more publications covering different elements of the industry. And I could give you all of it and let's you, you, raise me. You know, <laughs> someone will do it faster. I mean, we have so much to cover, right? But a pure focus on technology right now, you, you, you have companies that do consulting and press and like that's it's just going to become two things. It's going to be yep. a thing and another thing. And then you're going to have another one on human resources. A lot more options. Many more options of content. Language magazine is apparently not part of our industry, but it is completely part of our industry. So I've been trying to connect with their editors and it's like, let's collaborate. This is the way yep. it needs to happen. Absolutely. So we need more great products covering the industry, covering the characters. I think that will happen. I think yep. we'll have many more legends. So right now, if you look at it, right, someone comes from the industry, you're 21 years here. When I came, I come in and every month, every event, I discover a new legend that I didn't right. know about. Uh, like the most recent one was uh, Richard Sykes. Okay, and Richard. Oh, wow. Bubbling. I love Richard. <laughs> and it's like, this man is incredible. Like, yeah. he's got passion. He wants, he loves what he does. And I'm like, that's me. That's me. I, I, I you know, and, and so many more people every time. It's just cool. more and more people. I think it's just multiplying, right? I'm sure. here. Like, I've been here uh, a, a year, a year and a half, because I joined a NIMS in October 2023. It'd be two years in. Yep. In, whenever right it's uh, i think i think we'll have more legends that will yep. pop up i think we'll have larger companies pop up Deepel, Deepel loves being part of our industry so Deepel was not in the map and then all well i have to check all what all the consultants were saying but i remember <laughs> Deepel as initially not like really our industry or considering our industry like do yep. we consider open ai to be in our industry i don't know I don't yeah. know. I will, I will have to check those things. But I think our understanding, that would be the other thing. I think the understanding of our industry will change. Yeah, we, we, need to we, need, we need to remove a little bit of a tribalism in our industry, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I think we will move beyond that. And then we'll, we'll yep. accept some very successful startup entrepreneurs. The picture will look uh, very different. Uh, That's right. There'll be there'll be a lot of cash, but we we need the big people to have. You know, we need we need the big CEO to say we're gonna we're gonna do a a fund and we're gonna do seed capital for ten startups a year. That's it. That's yeah, all you need. Yeah, and then yeah. you get the industry to be at a completely different level. I think that will happen. I love that uh, idea. I think some so someone will do it. Someone will yeah, do it. I appreciate it. It's a no brainer. It, yeah. It's a no brainer. Someone will do it. Or someone is already doing it. It's just not saying much. Probably in the thought process, but they haven't put it into action yet. I hope they do it. I hope, hope they, they do, do it, it as well. I hey, Eddie, I want to, uh, for the uh, cognizant of the time here, I want to thank you so much for joining. And I don't know about the audience, but I truly enjoyed this conversation. I hope the audience will enjoy it as much as I did. And I hope they get something out of it. I mean, all of our conversations are unscripted, unbiased, and uh, we aim for these conversations to be as natural as possible. And we aim for them to come up with few ideas that people can take away and action in their life, in their business as well. 
Eddie Arietta, thank you so much for this. Any last words before I terminate the recording? Yeah, I think people in the industry, they take for granted the connection element and, and the cooperation and collaboration. That is the that is the differentiator yep. of uh, the, the community that's the localization industry, as we call it, and as we need to start re-understanding. So I, I invite people to connect to send content to multilingual, to start conversations, to start podcasts, to write more, to talk about it more, uh, and, and share with multilingual, share it with Robin. Uh, I think that's my invitation. There's so much room for collaboration with events, with podcast organizers. We're open for everything. Absolutely. That's related to this conversation we're having, of course. And if you just want to have coffee, of course, I'll be, I'll be at Lockworld, I'll be at uh, ATA, uh, and hopefully in other events in the future. Absolutely. Uh, for me, to uh, the audience, uh, thank you so much for listening in today for this uh, Localization Fireside Chat episode. We're recording episode number 40, uh, sorry, 84. And thank you again to Eddie Arrieta from uh, Multilingual Media for joining me today. I'll see you next week. Uh, when I uh, when we do another interview uh, with another industry leader, and I can't wait to publish this particular uh, interview with Eddie's comments on it. Eddie, thanks again. Uh, thanks from the bottom of my heart. Hopefully, it's not the last time we see each other. Hopefully, you can come back to the uh, channel and share your thoughts and idea. Please consider the channel your channel, and you're welcome anytime. You don't need an invitation. Thank you so much. And everyone who was listening, thank you so much for listening. And, and like I said, let, let's connect and I'll be super happy to come back. And if we can meet at an event and have a coffee in person, uh, Robin, let's just figure it out. Uh, we'll have figure some coffee. Out, let people know where, where you are at. I'd love to listen uh, now to, to your perspectives. But it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for the name. It's been a pleasure as well. So here you go. I'm going to stop the recording and uh, we'll stick around for a second.